Hello, guys. Welcome to the new podcast called NTA. No talks allowed. That's a misnomer. We this is a podcast where we talk about Linux without really talking about Linux. We just wing it. We just discuss things. And if you want to call us up on it, you're free to do so. Not only that, this is me, Dark Zero, the clown. And I'm missing my... But, hey, I'll have it next time. And with me is Josh, the brainiac, down here. uh, Where knowledge... Where you will gain the most knowledge. He's in encyclo- a walking encyc- a Linux encyclopedia. I would like to contest that. <laughs> I just read oh, you the are. man page. Well, you transform the man page into something we enjoy consuming through you. I try to, at least. And we have Big Pod, the... Um, how should I call Big Pod? The opinionated... So, yeah, and on this podcast, we we'll just, we'll just take it uh, uh, with a grain of salt, take everything we say uh, with a grain of salt, we're just the three stooges of Linux. That's how I call it, ourselves. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, Big Pod, I have a question for you. Go ahead. If somebody wanted to shout at us and tell me how good of a job Steve just did there, where did they contact us at? Do you know? No, you would know that. Oh, I would know that? Well, maybe if they just send an email to contact at tuckspace.com and uh, tell us how good of a job Steve just did, because I, I want to know. Because what do you think? Because if you would send an email to there, it, would, it should relay back to all three of us at the same time, as long as, you know, I got things set up right. Because, you know, cloud, fancy Cloudflare things. <laughs> yeah, and what do you think, Josh? How did I do? I think you did a fine job. <laughs> I'm gonna get myself a red nose. Next well, time. all right, all right. So, uh, obviously, there is no tux allowed here. Uh, just, just saying, uh, no, no penguins, no, none of that. Yeah. Just absolutely <clears throat> nothing. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, we're not talking about tux today. So, uh, Big Pod. Yeah. I heard you use GNOME, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, and I'm also using some GNOME. And, uh, Steve, I heard you're on KDE Plasma right now, but, uh, you have love affairs with GNOME sometimes. Yeah, uh, off and on, as usual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there's this wonderful article or that was that's posted on medium.com. Uh, titled "No, the No Mess is Not an Accident," and it is a lengthy article. It uh, is, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, there are some things that this article points out that uh, enlighten me a little bit, and some other things where you talk about issues that I've been unable to replicate, even though I'm using the same known version that he's using in this article as well. I Same. think, uh, let me double check my GNOME version real quick. It's 45.3, right? 45.5? Uh, 45.4. Yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't used GNOME in quite a while myself because I've been busy with, uh, with the... Okay, if I pronounce it, I'm going to pronounce it how everybody pronounces it. They gave it that name, not me. It's Zlap It. It's not Slap It, it's Zlap It with an X. But I've been so busy working on Slapit, I didn't have time to mess around with any other desktop environments. But that article, uh, at least the beginning of that article, <laughs> is a bit, um, how shall I put it, uh, very truthful, but in a very strong and opinionated matter, uh, uh, fashion. To me, it seems more passive aggressive, the style of no offense, and then some quite offensive stuff, which some of it is true, some of it, yeah, Yeah. I wouldn't say true. Yeah, especially when they start the article by by saying immature-ish, opinionated, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I mean, uh, let let me quote the very first sentence here. Uh, 
GNOME accomplishes what seems to be impossible. It's the most limited and bloated desktop environment for Linux. Yeah, that well, is true. It, it is, it, it is uh, using quite a bit of memory, but limited? Not so much. Questionable. I, not Very so much. questionable. <laughs> yeah, and especially that if you test the latest version of GNOME, I've seen it on videos, I haven't seen it on uh, in real life, but I've seen videos of someone testing the latest GNOME 46 beta, and the performance is way better than Plasma on first boot, at least. I'm going to say this, that uh, GNOME, GNOME is limited true in some fashions, but that that is, pro in my opinion, its biggest feature. Yes. It gets out of your way. Exactly. Unlike some, some desktop environment where you need to basically tweak everything for it to for it to be this just gets out of your way it is what it is there is it works how it works and that's it it gets out of your way it's exactly when when people get angry when we compare it to mac os we only compare it to mac os because it's the closest thing to it like mm. they sandbox their uh, uh not sandbox sandbox is a bit uh too, too confusing of a term, but the way they built their applications, they build it. They build their applications for their desktop environment, and that's where they work the best. And people start, uh, how do, how can I say? Uh, they start judging those applica uh, GTK application or GNOME applications when they use them on desktop environments like KDE or or try to use them on Hyperland or whatever. You cannot judge those applications using them outside the environment they were built for. Yes, but at the same time, if you look at uh, something like Qt app, they, they also don't fit into GNOME environment or any other GTK environment. Well, they, they fit a little bit. They fit a little bit really better. Fit. Yeah, they don't really fit. Yeah, nothing fits in in a different place, but they function better on uh, Qt apps. Function better on GNOME than GNOME apps function on KDE desktop. Uh, yeah. Because the developers on GNOME, they have a very strict policy is built them for GNOME and nothing but GNOME. We don't they care they about anything They have vision else. and they are trying yeah. to execute that vision. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, this article points out that uh, GNOME developers are, are really opinionated, which they that, are. that building a vision needs to have opinionated developers. Well, yes. That, that's not ju just true for GNOME, but any open source project. Uh, yes. I honestly think that if you're a developer and you're and you're uh, developing on, on a very popular open source project, you have the right of opinion, whether everybody agrees with you or not. And whether anyone agrees with you. At the end of the day, yeah, it's your it, project. It doesn't matter, to be honest with you, because, you know, uh, I'll use Mozilla Firefox as an example here because, you know, people love to hate on some of the features that Mozilla packs into Firefox. I think that pocket, uh, that little button that uh, saves, that can save and summarize articles for you uh, through a third-party service, that's actually a wonderful feature of Firefox. And yeah. I actually agree with Mozilla packaging that into Firefox. And it's yeah. it's not necessarily something that I personally use all the time, but every now and then, yes, I, I do use it. And yeah. uh, I have seen multiple mer uh, pull requests trying to strip that out of Firefox and Mozilla developers coming back and saying no. no. They have all right to say no and that's it. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah, simple, it, it's very simple, but when you when you think uh, on a desktop environment level, where it's expected that users are going to use those applications outside, you know, like people are on like because here's the here's the reasoning why, because simply because a lot of GTK applications are more uh, GTK applications are available than cute ones for a yeah. lot of use cases. Like you, you oh, look yeah. for an application that does X and Y, and you need it right now. You will find a GTK version. You're, you're, it's, you're, it's less likely you're gonna find a cute version. 
for KDE. Yeah. You're more likely to find one that's built using the GTK toolkit, and that's what you're going to use. Like I'm using Vivaldi, other people are using uh, Firefox. All these applications are built with GTK in mind, not Qt. So whatever browser you use is GTK, ex with the exception of Falcon and Qt browser and the couple of uh, handful ones that are built with Qt. But the rest, the most popular ones, are built with GTK in mind. That's why uh, no matter what desktop environment or window manager you're going to be using or what, what, what library you'll be using, you'll end up using a, GTK, a, a thousand GTK applications versus yeah. 100 Qt. So, well, uh, there's some historical precedent to that too, because uh, Qt, uh, in general, has always had like a less free, free and more restrictive license compared to GTK. Yeah. And, whereas GTK has always had that GPL license be behind it, so it's, there's historical pre precedent, especially when you know at one point GTK was actually maintained by the by the Free Software Foundation, which not the last ten years they haven't been so prevalent, but you know ten. 10 20 years ago the free software foundation was a huge part about uh when it came to uh d the desktop marketplace for not just linux systems but unix like systems in general <coughs> yep so uh the 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 problem here is m m users that come to to linux they they find they they uh they don't understand what's cute what's GTK, they just download the app that suits their needs on whatever desktop environment they are on. That's my argument. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so but... If it doesn't suit, as long as it works... Yeah, I I've used apps that are GTK on Qt. I've used Qt apps on GTK. And yes, they don't, they don't, they're not 100% cohesive with the look and feel of the, of the no. operating system, but at the same time, if you you're gonna go with i don't know someone on someone who comes from windows they're they're already used to it because yeah hey, windows, windows is not coherent at all <laughs> no i'm not saying that windows isn't coherent i'm saying that on windows every application handles their own teaming yeah it isn't it isn't system-wide which why which i am still of the opinion that it's better than actually having system-wide teaming for various reasons. But it does bring on our later topics to the question of fragmentation, but let's st stick with GNOME for now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, one, of the, one of the first points that this article brings up is where, uh, is where the article is complaining about static text being one of the simplest things you can possibly implement in programming. Uh, I'm not certain if this developer has ever looked into what it takes to create a plain text file on a computer. Yes, what, what <laughs> it takes to put plain text onto the screen. Yeah. Uh, yes, is the simplest one to do among all the other really complicated things, but it ain't actually all that easy to do anyway. Yeah, it, uh, that's sad, All of and, it is uh, heavily complicated. This, this one is least complicated, but bugs I can some... still be there. I also took the liberty of doing some checks on this article too, some basic fact checking. Uh, this article was posted two days after Gnome fixed that bug that he's talking about in this article, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and 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 also yesterday I watched a uh, the interview. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Brody did with um, with an, one of the Gnome developers, X Bottles developer as of recording of this uh, video, uh, yeah. this podcast, but uh, the guy mentioned, now he's working on the calendar, the GNOME calendar, for example. And he mentioned something along the lines of the, the GNOME calendar, you can, with the GNOME calendar as it stands, you cannot even use the keyboard. That's yeah. why he stepped in and he wanted to fix all, all these issues and neglected bugs, as, as he called them, but they're not really bugs, they're just neglected code that has been there for 11 years. But He's there to, to work on stuff that otherwise the GNOME devs have neglect, neglected for so long. And when uh, Mia Beta, or Mi Beta, whatever the, char the AI character on YouTube is called, uh, men uh, showed the code online, it took, it took them 11 years to put uh, 
16 character line. Yeah, but a lot of people think that since it's 16 characters, it's going to be easy to figure out. As someone well, who wrote I'm... enterprise level code, like a professional code, yeah, it ain't that easy. <laughs> it can get, sure it can get complicated Steve real was... fast. I I'm sure that, Steve, when you were working on like a Calamari's configuration for Zero Linux, uh, you there there was a bug somewhere in the in, in that configuration where it was because you forgot to close a parenthesis or a quotation. Yeah. It, it, it's really that same issue where it's just like, you're going to spend like the next three hours looking at that. Imagine looking at the, at that configuration file compared to like the source code of your, of a desktop environment. I've seen oh, developers yeah. look for a whole day, look for a single character that is missing. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the compiler doesn't tell them where it is missing or they work in a language that doesn't even do that kind of things. Yeah, but but in my case, it, it was a kind of mistake. Uh, but in the GNOME development, uh, they're more advanced than to have some weird, stupid mistakes like that. Unless I'm yeah. um, <laughs> It's computers. It's all sticks and chewing gum holding Turns everything computers together. Computers barely work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if it's if it's uh, uh, taping together things that makes no sense to make something that will work. Yeah, but saying that the, that the GNOME developers are immature is is wrong, kind of, kind yeah. of for me, because they're not immature. They ju they just have a a simple vision and they're working with the confines of this vision. They they're yeah. not even looking left and or right. They're just sticking to to this narrow road that is called GNOME, and they're making it work as best as they can. That's it. And let's talk about some of the, as as the author put it, amateurisms of GNOME. So first one, he points out that, that the hot corner for dash or to access the overview or activity menu is in the top left, while the dash, the the quote-unquote uh, bar is on the bottom. Yeah. Well, while yes, I would agree that that seems like counterproductive UX decision, it is actually, in my opinion, actually a pretty good decision on the default GNOME site because that's the actually one of the few corners where you actually won't hit it all that often unless you actually mean to hit it. Yeah. Well, yeah, when you think about it... Uh, Top is less it, likely to hit than bottom. Well, when you think about it, uh, users users from, like, other systems are used to interacting with things on the bottom of the screen for, like, uh, opening and launching their applications. That's why that, that panel's still on the bottom. Uh, in the meantime, they're also used to managing the, win the, the individual windows in the upper right corner, where, you know, you've got your minimize, your maximize... Or upper left button. corner, depending on, depending on whether it's Windows or Mac. Yeah, depending. Uh, even then, it, it creates a paradigm where it's just like, if you want to do anything with GNOME, you just go to the upper left corner. That's yeah. called UI consistency. That actually that actually didn't start with GNOME. GNOME didn't have the hot corner until the Unity desktop environment start started that. Yeah. I wasn't there during the uh, Unity days, but... Neither okay. was I. <laughs> so... Well, no, you, you used that Mate thing. <laughs> no, during the Unity time, I, I was on uh, I was on something called Windows. Oh, okay. Well, the way that Unity worked, it, and uh, you can you can still uh, download like the Ubuntu Unity edition. You can still see it's, it. It's not like as polished as it used to be, but if you were using Ubuntu like back in the day, like uh, before seventeen ten is when is when they published the first GNOME release, I think. But uh, so like 16.04 is probably like the best implementation of Unity still. And uh, if you everything that you want to do in Unity, you just went to the upper left corner. Uh, that's where your that's where your launcher button was. You hit that that pulled up the, the Unity dash and then you could access all your applications from uh, from either on the far left side of your screen or you could manage your global menu by going up along the top of the screen. And uh, to interact with all of that, you had to first put your mouse in the upper left corner of the screen. Okay, upper left, not right. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's... because the idea was that if it was in the upper left, you were managing the you were managing the the desktop environment. If you were in the upper right, you were managing the window. Mm. Yeah. Now that's, a, that's a good that's a good way of doing it, though. I, I find. Yeah. Let's jump to the next one that I think is interesting. It's the the way that basically the user cannot tell which which windows are minimized or closed unless they switch to the overview mode. Or if if the window is in tray or trade, users can't even tell if it's trade because there is no tray in GNOME. Well, okay, well unless... let let me raise you a question. If okay. you're using a if if you are using a system that normally has a system a system tray applic style thing, how often do you actually interact with the tray icons on it? Um, a lot, a very, lot, very very rarely. For a me, lot. they are for me they are for me either either for most applications I either don't care that they are even trade, and for those that I do, I will interact with a lot. But those those. Though that's like one application. I'm not yeah, joking. And, it's uh, one called Steve. When, I, when I'm Discord. when I'm asking this, I'm not talking about like your volume settings. Yeah, that's. I'm talking about like interacting with like the Steam icon or the Discord icon. I know what like you that. mean. I know what you mean. Okay. And uh, I interact with the tray on a daily basis, like a thousand times a day. Yeah. And, I have uh, three, I have three monitors, and now, people would think three monitors. You already have the applications open, and you don't need the, the tray to interact with them. Well, I launched because I have my most popular games uh, in the Steam tr uh, tray icon. Uh, for example, I just launch a game from the tray icon instead of having yeah. to navigate to the page on Steam and click play game and do all okay. that. I just do it so, from the tray icon. So I know that we're a really small scale example. But that's two thirds of us that don't even use a system tray. Yeah, yeah. I'm so special. I'm what special. Does it, yeah. What does it look like at scale? Like, what do uh, I know that uh, we we don't we in general like telemetry isn't exactly a very popular subject uh, of you know um, among a Linux, Linux desktop community. But that's really but, what uh, telemetry is for to yeah. see this kind of patterns. The question is, is a system tray actually going to be that beneficial, or is there an alternative that's better? Because when an application is running in the system tray, it's using the exact same system resources as to whether or not you had the window actually open on your screen. Yes. And the way that GNOME handles handles uh, workspaces individually, there's no performance loss for having a thousand workspaces with a thousand different applications open yeah. on them compared to having one workspace with a thousand different applications opened on a system tray. And it's important to know that GNOME now has a quote unquote way to handle tray. They have yeah. in the in the GNOME man in the GNOME power menu, whatever the thing is called, where they have power settings like audio settings, like, there is an option for background applications where you see all the applications that are running in the background. You see your Discord, you see your Steam, even if it isn't open. Yeah. Well, although I still uh, have my tray because it comes with the the image I, for silver blue I use, but it's but if it didn't run or when I had to close it because it was bugged, I just didn't care. Yeah, uh, like for for me being the special one in the group, uh, I prefer to close because I have a, a habit. Well, my, my habit is having Dolphin on the right screen with the terminal above it, having another terminal on the center screen, having the browser and my virtual machine, my uh, Proxmox window virtual machine on the center screen, and I have my social media on the left screen. And I don't like workspaces. People are going to say, I know they're going to say in the comments, what about workspaces? I don't care for workspaces. So I uh, interact with the applications that have been minimized from directly from the system tray. I know this, that they use the same amount of uh, resources, but I prefer to control everything, even uh, update my kernel using the, uh, the the system tray, using a third-party app, controlling uh. OBS, controlling Steam, controlling, uh, I, I have my weather stuff, 
uh, my audio, everything from yeah. from the system tray. And that that's completely fair, but it's just like and that could easily using... be a map indicator, which is yeah, that... it is it is a gnome centric way of doing it. It's actually quote unquote better. Here's the thing. Depending who Here's... you ask. Which brings up another subject. Uh, some distributions like Arch, thank you, Arch, uh, they didn't implement that part of GNOME. So you cannot see your applications in the uh, quick setting. Well, Arch also typically is really slow to update GNOME compared to other operating systems as well. <laughs> Which is really weird due to its yeah. rolling nature. Uh, bear in mind, I said operating system, not distribution. Because when I'm talking about like your yeah. your user experience, I'm talking about the operating system experience, not the distro experience. Yeah, there, there, it it sounds really silly to hear it like that. But when you start thinking, when you st when you separate the term distribution from operating system, and realize how different they wow. really are, uh, it it actually does begin to make a little bit of sense. I, I yeah. would posit that they're they're not different. The distribution is a moot point anyway. That it's they're all operating systems, and we yeah. should stop stop saying distribution. But again, that's a topic for another day. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> but, stick uh, to GNOME. I think Arch doesn't even ship GNOME forty five yet. I think it's still on GNOME forty four. I might be no, wrong. No, no, they are on forty five. They are on forty five. Okay. But here's the thing with Arch. Uh, Arch they ship their own version of GNOME. Like yeah. every every distribution ships their own version of a, of a desktop environment or window manager. You're not gonna find uh, you're gonna find common grounds between various distributions, but you'll find less common grounds between others. Like Arch, they ship GNOME 45, but they ship a version that is either stripped down, or they just pick at little features and they don't include them. Uh Joshua, we, we, you and I are at, on GNOME 45.4, right? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, GNOME is on 45.0. Oh, no, uh, on Arch. Okay, so yeah, they're still a little bit behind. T yeah. Typical Arch things when it comes to just GNOME, which I don't necessarily fault Arch Linux for because I don't know how many people they actually have maintaining the GNOME stack. I, I'd imagine that it's probably not very big or not very many. I do know that whenever GNOME's out of date, they immediately uh, delete any posts and comments complaining about how GNOME is out of date on their subreddit. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But, but that that begs the question. The various distribution, how, how, how would one judge GNOME? How would one be able to judge GNOME unless they use GNOME's distribution? The way GNOME developers intended GNOME to be because... Any other distribution you use that ships GNOME, like I said, they ship their own specific version of yeah. GNOME. You you cannot judge GNOME completely unless you are using the the, the GNOME distribution. That, that that's a problem one. with Linux. Problem with again with the our next topic fragmentation of Linux. Yeah, where basically every distribution when they build anything, they're built they, they will have their own version of that. Yeah, that. That, that when we so, get to the topic, it's it's very interesting. That's a very interesting topic. It's the yeah. uh, so we have to have to talk about the canonical, quote unquote, version of GNOME, which is the one put out by the GNOME developers. Yeah, and we're talking about the word canonical, not the company yes. canonical. By the way, so we're talking <laughs> about the one we find in GNOME OS. Yeah. But that is a testing distro, so a testing operating system, and nobody should be using it. Except <laughs> GNOME developers. I mean, I mean uh, well, we have I, Josh I here. I have on hardware <laughs> before. <laughs> well, I was going to say. Well, it, it turns out, for an example, they do ship Flatpak in GNOME OS. Yes, so yes. it is theoretically possible a, to use it as a desktop operating system. I am really thankful for <laughs> GNOME OS. It brought out, in my opinion, one of the best technologies for operating systems that exists. OS3. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to summarize. Uh, we spent uh, enough time on this topic. I'm just going to summarize it in a couple of words. The uh, GNOME developers are not amateurish. They're advancing at the pace that they are always advanced at. at. And uh, although they are opinionated, they are opinionated for a reason. Uh, they are 
very uh, they care about the stability over features unlike other desktop environments uh like KDE and uh, okay sometimes it comes at uh, at the cost of uh features at a fast pace like we kind of users are kind of used to with other desktop environments with which causes those users to be a bit uh how should i put it uh uh patient less patient but with gnome if you are patient and all you care about is a functional system gnome uh, delivers gnome delivers the only area where gnome does not de uh, deliver and we can call them opinionated is when it comes to gaming but gaming is not their first priority it's, yep. uh, it's functionality it's work it's business it's uh everyday things not gaming gaming is important but not as important as everything else they will get to it when they will get to it if you are impatient don't use gnome use something that uh, that has a rolling release like kde like uh uh hyperland god forbid if you are masochistic enough uh but use whatever pleases you don't judge something because Hey, it's too slow. It doesn't give me what I want at the speed I want it to. Those developers are idiots. They're amateurish. They're stupid. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Just this is what the philosophy of GNOME has always been: either accept it or just move on. That's it. That's summarizing the whole thing. Yeah. They're not amateurish. Don't judge the developers just because you don't get out of them what you want. Even then, there's. A reason why extensions exist and even though they're inherently not the best user experience or even developer experience sometimes uh they exist to to address some of the things that the known developers just don't want to touch they they can always just say use an extension for that <laughs> yeah and don't judge and another thing about extensions don't uh, don't go uh hating on gnome because extensions break the only reason extensions break is because GNOME get, uh, gets a major release every six months. Unlike uh, KDE, people are, I see the same kind of complaints now on KDE Plasma because Plasma is shifting to Plasma 6. All the plasmoids, plasmoids, basically widgets or extensions, will cease to function once Plasma 6 is out. And once they cease to function, people are start going to compl complain saying, hey, KDE is a piece of shit. None of my extensions work. None of my plasmoids work. And none of these work. This is what happens when major refactoring, code refactoring happens. This, this is what is... happens when you have third party code depending on some some other third yeah. party code. This yeah. will happen. It's, this will it's happen. not a it's not a question. Will it? It's not a question might when? it? It's a, it's a question. No, when? It's, when? it's it's an answer of will when as soon as possible. And even yeah. then, if you're an, if you're an extension developer and you're constantly complaining about how GNOME is constantly breaking your extension every time GNOME pu publishes a release, it's it's on you to realize that GNOME OS exists for you, yeah. for you to test your code to see if it's uh, if it works or not. And the GNOME developers puts out this code months in advance. And yeah. it's important to know they, they they say they don't have a a stable extension API. So as soon as you go in. You know what what is the happening going to happen? Yeah, what to expect exactly. Even so. then, there there is a small portion of the GNOME team that is working on coming up with a stable extension API. It's just that the it that's just a process that's going to take time. And yes, I know that extensions have been around for a very long time, and that the uh, GNOME is a little slow slow to you know addressing the stability of an API. I'm glad that they're doing that they're addressing the stability of the API now compared to never doing it. Yeah. Yeah, like Cosmic, for example. They're in integrating extensions directly into the desktop environment code space. So, yeah, which... Uh, which is much better. I mean, yeah, it, it's much better, and I'm glad that the, they're going to be doing that. It's just a question of how much of a maintenance burden will that eventually become 10 years down the road. That's yeah. why they, for, for the non-essential ones, they, they're including them as uh, separate applets, but yeah. directly, yeah, which, directly connected to the desktop environment. It's not something third party. Which, that's going to be a thing that's, re that's remained to be seen. But in the meantime, uh, since you know we're touching so much on GNOME here, and we've already 
mention the next topic uh, multiple times. Let's go ahead and move on. Before we do know, move on, uh, this article was on medium.com titled No Mess is Not, not an Accident by a uh, writer Full al- Alas. Full Alas. We'll Sorry if I butchered we'll, your name. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a link in the in the video uh, video version's description. So. Yeah. Yeah, which uh, don't read just this article too. Like, if you want to like uh, see like the full uh, depth of like this discussion, uh, he does have two citation links at toward in like the first paragraph of the article. Is the those two are also worth worth a read too to like get a fully gr- full grasp on this person's opinion of no. Yeah. You can tell that he's obviously a KDE user. And yeah. he has <laughs> an article is filled with uh, examples and. Uh, links to to such a, to examples of his points, whether they are good or not. That's a that's a that's a question that you you should make an opinion of. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of fragmentation, since we uh, attacked this article multiple times, the the first paragraph is kind of a summary to the entire thing, but. Uh, it's titled fragmentation is part of the open source evolutionary process, but it must be observed and managed. Like, uh, yeah, it, 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 fragmentation is part of, like he says in the article, it's part of Linux. It's what makes Linux so interesting. Without the fragmentation, Linux would, uh, and choice, because fragmentation equals choice. I agree with that. What do you think? Well, fragmentation is uh, a hard topic to discuss, especially in open source, where anybody can do whatever they want. But it does pose a kind of a question. The, the article poses a question whether fragmentation is is actually equal in all com- all open source communities. Yeah, and I, I have I have uh, um, uh, I one of my legs I have in Linux community, and I I, I like I have in a, in cloud native community. Both of those revolve around open source, and I got to say that that Linux community has huge problems with fragmentation. Well, of course, how many distros are there? That's actually my. Pro- <laughs> but that's actually the point I was trying to make. There, there are probably more than thousand distributions. Uh, even though, in reality, we could do with about two hundred. Uh, just and... to let you guys know, when it comes to package managers, there's actually an official standard for package managers on Linux. Huh? It, it's called the XDG Desktop uh, Standard, of which, oh. by the way. In the event that you guys have never read this, it says that RPM is the official file format of Linux. Yes, and for <laughs> those of you who who are listening to the audio version, uh, Steve Dark Zero is just making some really, really, really surprising faces right now. But yes, because because I I I kind of with Zero Linux I kind of made the problem worse. <laughs> yes. Yep. But yes, RPM is the standard for package management. Yeah, that's why it's being yeah. used uh, by uh, Red problem, Hat and the Red, Hat is, and, uh, Red Hat spin. Yeah, the problem is that this uh at the standard came into existence uh before uh Debian finalized apt and made apt well, not necessarily app, but like the package or the Debian yeah. package, and then introduced apt, the package manager that could actually install package, a package with its dependencies, unlike RPM. Yes, but that's a, that's a problem. I've discussed this problem in one of my videos that the older package managers don't actually have ability to uh, to use repositories to do things like uh, dependency resolution. That's a that's a for them. That's a standard of using a uh, using a front end, which is what DNF, Yum, Apt, and many others are. They're front ends for the package manager. On the other hand, things like Arch Linux with with ALPM, 
for which mm -hmm. uh, Pac-Man is the biggest user of ALPM, it's all rolled into one system. Yeah. And uh, and as they mentioned in the article, the, the fragmentation does come with a huge downside, which yes. is the complexity for com consumers and vendors and the difficulty of identifying, testing, and deploying code libraries that may be similar in nature. This is a very important part. Uh, Which, you know, we me we mentioned earlier uh, Brody Robertson's interview with, like, this uh, developer who, who formerly worked with the Bottles team, specifically. Bottles ran into this issue. Yeah. Where distros would package the Bottles project and uh, deploy it in their own repositories. And then it would fall out of date compared to, like, what the bottle developer is yeah. bottles developer is working on of which then somebody would come and go like hey i'm using this debian stable system with this version of bottles that's like uh, that you haven't looked at for two years now and i'm having this bug uh can, can you fix that's this not for bottles me problem that's not a bottles <laughs> problem sorry it's not a bottles problem <laughs> and no so so i'm gonna tell a bit of an anecdote i've been multiple times asked as a, as a linux user among among people who don't use Linux, but still want to ship their software on Linux. What environment should I target? That was the question. Yeah, Because yeah. they consider each distro their own environment, which is actually correct, especially each major distro, which, which is where I got the number 200. And yeah, I could talk well, about why 200, but... Let, uh, let's talk, let's say that... So my answer to that question, is there is only one environment you should care about nowadays, Flatpak. Yeah, I was going uh, to say the same thing. That's the environment unless, we should target. All of us. Unless you specifically want from... your package to be officially supported by Ubuntu, which then you want to be packaging up as a snap. Yes. Oh. But the pain. Uh -huh, flat the pain. Mm. In my opinion, mm. the, the main Linux environment is Flatpak. Well, See, that's... It's the community's choice of format. <laughs> well, here's yes, the, here's but, the, here's but that's, here, it became a standard because of that. Well, here's well, yeah. A, here's another thing that I uh, that uh, that uh, uh, causes me to touch a little bit on my uh, toolkit is I was like, should I represent uh, present the user with flat the flatback version of X and Y app or should I give them the native one? So I decided in the end after a lot of thought and discussions with the various people on discord i was like let's offer uh, let me offer both but let me put in parentheses official unofficial if the flatback is the official version i will label it as such and vice versa so but that's part of fragmentation that's the biggest part of fragmentation now different distros i recommend they do the same they tell the user oh you want the official version it's a flat pack. You don't. You want the unofficial version? Here it is from our repositories. It's up to you to decide. But then this will introduce confusion to the user. And that's the problem with with the whole idea of distributions. If let's say I make a distribution, and I need a tool for it, I'm gonna make a tool that will only work for that distribution. And that that's easily causes fragmentation, and honestly, makes makes everybody else who needs a similar tool but but for a different distribution have to do so the same so work basic, all over again so basically to summarize it in a single sentence uh so we don't get stuck on it uh, too long like we did on the previous uh, article it's the biggest problem of uh linux is distribution yes that's the biggest problem and package management each, yeah but, which come to distributions going, yeah, but that's what I was going to say. It's basically the more distributions we get, the more uh, uh, fragmentation in the fr package management we're going to get because each distro is opinionated and they want to ship their own version of the package management. Now, to raise a dissenting opinion here, I also think that this fragmentation could also potentially be a good thing too. Yeah, that's because, what I'm saying. Mm. And I can use... Uh, I'm just going to use Solus as a go as a shining example for this, because when so when the so the Solus team first came out, they they pushed the budgie desktop environment. They they were the first distro that that came out with it. In fact, they were the ones that actually made it at the time. Uh, they're separate projects nowadays, but 
Uh, they pushed that forward, but not only did they push that forward, but they also pushed massive improvements in like Steam itself on Linux. Whereas uh, Steam has always officially supported uh, supported uh, Ubuntu. Deb. Yeah, Deb. but Deb. Uh, Ubuntu or like the dev package, but they would always say that, hey, if you're going to be using Steam on Linux, use Ubuntu. Solus was the one distro that that got most of the Steam stack working on other distributions compared to uh, uh they came out with like the the uh, whole uh, Steam application translation layers. Uh, Solus p- also pushed forward like uh, LTA, uh, the LTO uh, uh, co- comp- uh, compilation fixes for uh, v- various software projects as well because every single package uh, that that they sh- publish in their package repository is built with the LTO. LTO optimizations, which theoretically makes b- your binaries faster. Which, which uh, you know, if you weren't using Linux like seven, eight years ago, there is a very noticeable difference between how Firefox would load on Ubuntu as a native package because you, this was before snaps and flat packs. It would it was very noticeable how long it would take Firefox to load when the same version of Firefox on Solus would load. Where it would load faster on Solus. Also, Solus just like boots magically stupid fast too. Yeah. But the question is, does that actually need to be a separate distro, or could it be just a separate, separate repository you could opt in? Uh, now, yes, it can be, but it could. But what this distribution, them doing this as a distro shows, is that it's a use use is that it's a user experience improvement that a user can actually grab and use without figuring out how to set up a repository. Yeah. Because uh, I honestly think that while flat packs are probably the, the standard going forward that we that the application developers should be packaging for, have you have uh, if you're not using a desktop environment like uh, GNOME or KDE Plasma, how do you set up a flat pack repo. Hmm, interesting question. I, I right? follow the follow the command commands on the on the screen that that the flat flat hub tells me and that's it. Now how do you know flat hub exists? Oh uh Fedora <laughs> because But Fedora okay now if you install Fedora now that's does a Fedora ever mention the word flat hub anywhere outside Never. of the fedora Never. magazine no that's that's another question of discoverability and yeah. that is a problem that linux has now uh to touch on this here when a distribution is shipping flat pack flat uh flat pack by default has no way to actually set repositories by default in, on compilation uh, when okay. you install Fedora, they use a systemd service to add their Flatpak repository. Or if you click the third-party button, add their Flatpak repository yes. plus uh, the Flat Hub repository. Mm. That's very different from how Flatpak natively does it. Because uh, if if you compile Flatpak on, onto a system, you need to manually specify uh, the, the uh, repository for it. Yeah. So if you're using a distribution like Arch... Mm. Uh, Arch actually includes a script to add the Flatpak repository. Yeah, just as soon but as you install the Flatpak. If you're uh, not using Arch, package. but you're using something like, say, Open Mandriva, or Open Susa, or uh, you know Gentoo, or like any other distribution out there in the wild, and you install Flatpak, you have to add that uh, repository manually. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm talking about like very niche distributions. Because, you know, there's a reason why Ubuntu is popular. Because, you know, they've got the magical powers of the Google search result. There's a reason why Fedora yes. is popular. There's a reason. Yeah. Uh, you're just but, making an argument for snaps, honestly. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to terms of user experience, snaps really do have a very, very... Uh, sna- snaps, in general, are, are objectively better user experience. Except yeah. when you look at the home directory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, going by Matt's complaint? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then Matt's, again, also, Matt's then also again, always calling ls-la in his 
in his uh, configurations yes. too. So uh, no, actually, actually, I found out he doesn't. He has a program. He has he has an alternative for LS that does that by default. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't which tell by me way, that. Don't when we're talking about that. Matt, we're talking about Matt from the Linux cast, and uh, he yeah. he has posted some very strong opinions about being very anti-snap and some when it comes to like the presentation of the home directory in his terminal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not talking about like your graphical fire manager. <laughs> I mentioned but, that I. I'm also part of the community called Cloud Native Community, where we also do, we also are very open source minded. Most most of the most of the parts are open source, but a lot of the fragmentation that happens there happens honestly for good reasons, and it's actually a benefit, unlike in Linux, where most of it, I wouldn't call it a benefit. Uh, fragmentation, in my opinion, fragmentation comes from opinion. When people are opinionated, uh, opinionated, opinionated enough, they 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 create their own distro. They fragment. They do their own uh, uh, their own thing, and that makes fragmentation even worse. Because hey, I don't want to do th things this way. They're forcing me to do things a way I don't like. Let me do. Let me branch out and create my own way of doing things, and that as that creates a problem, which is called fragmentation but and that that fragmentation has always been there from the very start too because yeah. uh yeah the the for let's talk about like the gnu project right uh the gnu project free software right uh free software we're only going to use free software we're only going to package free software everything is free software from from your desktop gui all the way down to like the micro micro architecture of your cpu it's all free software yeah yeah that's that was our first introduction to fragmentation there, all the way yeah. back in the, in the mid nineteen eighties. Problem <laughs> isn't fragmentation on its own. Fragmentation is actually a good thing. It brings more ideas to the to the scene. Yeah, Problem exactly. Comes That's... when yeah. fragmentation is like it is in Linux distributions, where a single change, which can be very tiny or even irrelevant. On in the grand scheme of things, causes the branching and fragmentation of that one thing. Th that's the, that's the reason there there are that many Linux distributions, because it is relatively easy to make a distribution, but at the same time, they make one or two changes. They they install a couple of programs. They remove something. They change change the wallpaper and that's it. And they call it a distribution. Sometimes, this or even where... just another distribution with the desktop GUI pre-installed. Yes. <laughs> and that, Stop that's... attacking me! Stop attacking <laughs> that's me! Where... <laughs> that's Big where... Big Bot used the... to do the same thing, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I feel so attacked. Well, uh, my, my, my history in distributions is I, I was uh, one of the maintainers of Ubuntu Mate, so... Ooh. It's one of the least... It's the least of that problem, but... Yeah still kind of problematic because but, why why does a desktop environment need to be a whole new distribution somebody's alexa is talking but okay uh that was my phone right there uh, we uh, can mute that again but why does that why does a desktop environment have to be a whole new distribution it shouldn't be it shouldn't be but yeah. uh, the, uh, what i like about this article is that it it talks about the negatives but it goes over uh, at, at a, in a short form, but the the most uh, most uh, the the biggest part of the article talks about the the, the good the, uh, that the fragmentation bring brings towards Linux. But at the we need to uh, what they say in the article is we need it requires management. Yeah. If we don't manage this uh, this fragmentation, it's gonna go uh, out of hand, which it has gone uh, because of it's, all this. It's a little. Yeah. It's a little it's a, late on some formats. But yeah, I mean, yeah, but then again, there's. The, it might also be uh, in Linux specifically. It might be because of the age of the community. Linux communities, for compared to some of the other communities, fairly old. But what, as I said, the, the it's a really good article. Article also has actionable insights. What yeah. to do, or or not what to do, but 
examples of what should be done to manage yeah. that. And they're actually nicely bullet pointed. Yeah. And, and we one should of, actually one go the, through them. Yeah. And the article as well will be linked in the videos uh, in this video's description. Yeah. But there's one point that really stood out to me is strengthen inter uh, foundation collaborations is due to the it's due to the fragmentation it it enhances the collaboration between different uh, open source projects and foundations uh, yeah, yeah. convening uh, uh, convening foundation leaders and working together to identify shared policy goals can help build trust and confidence so that is super true because if we didn't have such a wide variety of choice due to fragmentation we wouldn't have all been able some of us to be able to collaborate like I'll, i'm going to use my toolkit as a as an example again because this is the the, the hard uh, evidence that i have hard proof that i have is without people's collaborations in the open source community i wouldn't have been able to create such a tool to, to, or to convert the distro because the distro is as uh, if you didn't hear the distro no longer exists it's now just a post install script making your life easier uh, but the uh, the whole idea here is without their collaboration like yesterday i'm going to take an example from last night it's very recent i was talking to zaini zaini is one of the most awesome people i've ever had the pleasure to meet online it, thanks to linux uh, he's really into nix and because he's really into nix he's he's really uh, he has been swallowed by the need to configure and build his ideal system and sharing with the world and because of his this mindset he taught me yesterday he gave me ideas yesterday uh, on how i can present users with choices to install either one or multiple applications at the same time and he showed me how he gave me an idea on how to do that without this kind of uh, fragmentation and all these we wouldn't have been able to collaborate because if we had only one distro, let's say we had only one major Linux distro like Windows or whatever, it's it's not varied enough. We need uh, variety in our lives, uh, uh, and that benefits the the whole, not just the parts, the whole. So yeah, this is this is something awesome. Fragmentation brings that, but if we don't manage it like we haven't been doing for the past, I don't know how many years, look what it got us. It got us to a point where when I, when I mentioned the mere mention of Linux to some people, they shake in their boot because they have this I, correct idea. I'm not saying it's a wrong idea. It's correct when they say, oh, it's too fragmented. I wouldn't know where to begin. I don't, I don't know which one to choose, which one is the best for me, and I don't have time. And they speak of time, and time sometimes is of e of essence to some people. I don't have time to waste to test a million distros until I land on the one that works best for me. I want something immediate, and I want it, uh, uh, and I want to be up and running in no time. If you are like that person, yeah, you're not. It's uh, Linux is going to be very difficult due to this fragmentation. But fragmentation is as uh, someone eloquently put it on my server, it's a two-edged sword. So, good, bad. So, I say I say it has more good than bad. And before that, they also posit that maybe uh, they, it, would, it would serve open source project if we could forge better uh, alignments between them. And yes. they, they say that aligning similar projects under shared umbrellas, essentially, different foundations would eliminate things like duplication, so extremely duplication of work, it would econo economize overhead and reduce vendor fatigue. At the oh, same yeah, time, that's... I would posit what it would do, it would also simplify uh, funding because now nowadays you have to, f if you're going to donate something to a project, mm. first of all, finding that that donations for a for a project, some projects don't have those donations, but others that do, you have to now choose between what 
20, 30 projects you're using, who you're going to donate with. Number two, what if you could donate to five foundations that would split that money among different projects? That would simplify yeah. everything. And and it doesn't, and in my opinion, it doesn't have to be similar similar projects. It could be a group of I don't know. Let's let's say friends, a group of similarly, a group of together working. Uh, yeah, with the same to, idea, with the same end goal, people with the same or, end goal. or just just a group of people that I that honestly could start start on the same Discord server, who started who are friends, who yeah. work who work on separate projects. What if they could put them together under the same umbrella and have have that one one group uh, work on all of them, and it actually actually brings another side effect. That I, I just rem- just thought of, is what? that I actually mean that if a project gets quote unquote abandoned, if developers oh. want to work on it, there will be there will automatically be people who could inherit that project. It won't just yeah. it won't just go into nothing or be pulled away from you. It would actually have people who could at who could at least maintain it until a new developer is. Found and if if that new de- if that new developer is found, you could work on the same project, not on a fork of it. Yeah. Now, now the third point they they bring is harnessing open source maturity models, which essentially means that they are models by which you can assess maturity of different projects, and if you can identify those mature libraries, those mature components, projects, we can bring that we can bring the that them together or essentially gain benefits from those that are more mature than those that aren't yes and i agree with that one 100 percent. and if we point those out then it, then it means less chance for that for those that are more mature to to die for whatever reason to disappear on us because they're more likely to get developers more likely to to be more secure and so on yes now Number four, this one, this one actually I find really, really, really important, and actually I think it goes well with point number one, is enlisting skilled community managers, finding people who can manage community. That's that very is hard. really important, and also hard. That's why. That's why if we, you don't need ten community managers because there are ten projects. If we combine them in one, under one foundation and one umbrella, on one group whatever you want to call it it could have only one community manager because it is managing they're managing one large community and yep. but community managers are really important because uh, i've been a, a part of a project that has a skilled community manager and it makes community engagement completely different well that and before before you hit publish on that blog post you're about to post you can reference it across somebody else before you yes. hit publish and yeah and you fact, get those to. <laughs> and you get those ideas and get those better community engagement that, that you as a developer might not even think of because sorry yep. but as a developer i know i'm not a good people person <laughs> there might yeah. be some some great people person among developers but i'm yeah, not one of them <laughs> We could use a lot more pe- people friendly, people facing uh, yeah. pro- uh, community managers so we can get more projects seen, more eyes on on those projects. But unfortunately, the way I see it is uh, they it's very narrow. It's everyone for uh, on uh, for, on uh, for his for, on his own or for himself, whatever. We need community managers to see the benefits of different projects to, to, yeah. and and yes one community manager instead of a million is better because it's better for management overall yeah. and uh, the issue with that though is say like th- this this uh, group exists uh, I'll use the free software foundation as an example for this right do you, uh, would you want to be represented by the free software foundation no. Uh, no. If I was yeah. doing a, f- uh, would you want to be re- would you want to be represented by the Linux Foundation? Hmm. No. Nothing. Uh, what about the Gnome Foundation? No. 
if I was doing a foundation, probably form it myself. Right. You you'll make your own foundation. Again, right? Gnome has already had Gnome as a group of projects is already its own set of things. But it doesn't matter mean that I and you and you and however many people we f we friend with, we all have n small projects. Why yeah. don't we pull pull those resources together? Be yeah, a that's, group of could do, friends who, could do who, that. who work on those projects. Together. Even if we just work on our own projects, we have we have a group behind us to fall upon. And mm. and a and an easier way to get uh, donations to get everything. You get resources, get donations, get things like uh, cloud computing if it's necessary, and so on. Yeah, instead of Everything having many easier. So to sum it up in in Spock's words, uh, the benefit uh, the uh, the benefit for the one is better than the for the many or something like that. I don't remember the exact phrase, but instead of having fragmentation, just be one and benefit them. Many. Well, I forgot the, the saying. I was, it was on the top of my head, but <laughs> my, it didn't work. Oh, I'm a failure. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry, Spock. But yeah, it. Uh, it. I. I see it in. In. I see the benefit. Or uh, like, uh, if I, if I had one, there was one guy with managing. Uh, the Gnome Foundation, the the Fedora Foundation, and, and and everything, and but the ideology was one to benefit the many. It 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 would be better to manage. As as someone who doesn't uh, watch Star Trek, I guess you were thinking of benefit of the needs of many outweigh the need of few. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Google. <laughs> Sorry, Spock. <laughs> Rip. Love you. Uh, and Love and you. we just made every tricky angry. <laughs> <laughs> Please watch us next time. <laughs> or listen. Remember remember, this is a pilot episode, so all these are normal on a pilot episode. We learned a lot during this pilot episode, yeah. so we're going to fix everything in the in the official uh, official one. For clarification, now, I've never actually really watched Star Trek. I've watched maybe twelve episodes of the second generation. That's probably about it. <laughs> The next I, generation, yeah. I, I watch the I'm new the, the new stuff, uh, the new movies, and that's it. Speaking of uh, which, I got movies. mentioned yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I got mentioned by the Trek culture. Yay! So that's cool. <laughs> Yay! <It's zero. laughs> and the guy was like, "Zero Linux. Uh, what is a Linux guy doing in, in a Trek uh, Trekky uh, podcast?" Who knows? Sorry. <laughs> Who knows? But but let's let's look at the final point they make. Confront. Point number five, they they point out is the the problem with siloing within nations as a, as open source communities as as they posit that the open source community open source is a global endeavor, not a n nation national endeavor, which comes from problems with certain legislation that uh, that said that certain open source projects or stuff or, or works cannot be cannot be exported globally to, to not use a worse word and that is a problem that certain projects cannot be moved outside of certain countries borders but that comes from very very That's problematic. not always the open source developers. Pro uh, That's the problem thing. with law, not open source. Yeah, it, open it's mostly an had issue set, with uh, drawback of it. This gets the drawbacks of it, honestly. Yeah, uh, to use a very American example here, uh, because you know uh, I'm I'm the American of the of the of the podcast here. I got uh, the American all examples. my representatives for for legislature are well north of sixty years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you if you use another American example, ITAR. Simple yeah. as that. As soon as your software falls into ITAR, you ain't gonna gonna put it outside of US. Yeah, if you think explain if you think explaining to your mom how uh, how Facebook works <laughs> is difficult, try explaining like what your what say the Linux how what the Linux kernel is 
to to a legislator saying that hey, this is a good thing. We should probably use it. Or how they don't even know that, how to use their phone, <laughs> right? Or how the fact that it's on internet is automatically global. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully that's a thing that gets better with time. Yeah. But I think we exhausted the time for this topic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, before we go to the to, to the next topic, uh, I just want to uh, say thank you for whoever made it this long watching uh, this this topic after topic after topic yeah. kind of thing. Uh, I'm gonna take a breather for uh, for a second by saying Linux is it a potato or is it a tomato? They cannot tell the difference in most countries in the world. I know I use my computer. computer. I turn my computer on. It works. That's it a, don't work. They don't. Uh, most people don't need to know that, honestly. I'm just happy I can take a random Excel spreadsheet that's emailed to me and I can open it. Yeah. Uh, this article was uh, Fragmentation in Open Source Recommendations for Managing Complexity by Linux Foundations found on their blog. Link down in the video description. So, guys, we're going to call it a wrap there for, for the night here. I, I had a... I had a great time talking with you guys. Uh, this sh this episode is going to be a little long. We don't know exactly how long these these uh, episodes are going to be into the future. Uh, they might be about the same length. We, they might be a little bit shorter. Uh, that's just a process that the three of us are going to be working through over time. But in the meantime, if you'd like to give us feedback for the show specifically, you can send an email to contact at tuckspace.com. And uh, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com sl at slash at no tucks allowed. Uh, or you can just look at No Tucks Allowed in the search bar and you can find us that way because I know that's what you're going to do anyway. Yeah. Uh, you can you can follow Big Pod at youtube.com slash at Big Pod. You can follow Steve at Zero Linux Official on YouTube. And you can follow me, Josh, at 10 Lee J on YouTube. But in the meantime, guys, we're out of here. We'll see you next week. No, well, maybe not next week. We'll, we'll figure out. We'll, we'll see you next, next time. Yeah, next episode. <laughs> Goodbye. Yep. See ya.